was already pointed that way. Thank you so much for coming. You know, at, at 20 minutes up, there was nobody here, and you go, hmm. And it's so glad to see all, all you here, and I hope you're going to have a very interesting time. My name, I'm sure you are. My name is Rob Lupresti. I'm the map librarian. And uh, so I would like to um, thank you all for coming, and I would like to thank uh, Dennis Matthews, who has disappeared. There he is, yay! Who, Dennis is the manager of this area. And uh, he and his students, Jordan and Evan and Rachel, did all the hard work here, so I didn't have to. And uh, they were all beautiful setting up and managing this whole thing, and I'm very grateful to them. Um, you are sitting in the map collection, which has roughly 100,000 maps. Um, people ask what kind of maps we have. We have topographic maps, trail maps, political maps, cadastral maps, um, uh, nautical maps, and uh, the closer you get to Bellingham, the more maps we have, the farther away you get. You know, Antarctica, we have fewer maps. Uh, you're welcome to come here anytime between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. and uh, Monday through Friday, and, uh, and uh, we'll be happy to show you around. Let's see, one thing uh, that's been pointed out, I should say, uh, in case of an emergency, which we're not expecting, uh, there's an exit over there, a second exit. Go through the where this exit sign is, go there, turn left, you'll be out on High Street. Okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, if you'd like to know about future events like this, um, there is a sign-up sheet out in the hall on a slightly wobbly table. And uh, put your email down there, and we'll only use it to tell you about events like this or other exciting things that are happening in the map library. Occasionally, we have uh, giveaways of maps we no longer need. Okay, and of course, people say, "Oh, maps of Bellingham." Well, of course, the maps of Bellingham are the one we're never going to give away, right? But uh, you're welcome to do that. Um, occasionally, some people ask about donations. Um, we have occasionally taken donations of maps. Uh, we, we're not eager to get that because we have lots of maps. Um, occasionally people donate money, which is very useful, so you can talk to us about that. Uh, what is the Speaking of Maps program of which you are hearing? Uh, the Speaking of Maps program has been going on for a couple of years now. It is one per quarter, except in the summertime. Maps, uh, a, a speaker uh, usually connected with Western, talking about something related to maps. Melissa Rice from the Physics Department talked about her work helping to map Mars with the Mars rover. Um, we've had uh, speakers about wetlands and about um, uh, the Sailor Sea. And today we're finally getting into history, which I'm very excited about. Um, so again, if, and the next one is going to be Akila Flower, Assistant Professor of Geography at Western, talking about building a digital atlas of the Pacific Northwest. That's going to be on May 3rd. OK? And there will be cookies. Uh, I want to thank our co-sponsors for today's talk, which are Western Libraries, uh, Western's History Department, and the Ray Walpo Institute for the Study of Holocaust, Genocide, and Crimes Against Humanity here at Western. And finally, we get to the reason we're actually here. Uh, Ed Matthew is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of History at Western. He has taught, course, taught courses here at, uh, in German history. Uh, Holocaust, Gender and Sexuality, Western Civilization, and World History. And he had his PhD in German, Modern German History from the University of Michigan. And I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting talk. And please give him a good welcome. Uh, I would like to start off figuring out uh, modulation. So I'm speaking at a particular volume right now. Can people in the back hear me? Okay, I will speak louder then. Is this a better volume for people in the back? Okay, I will try as well, well as I can, but the louder I go, the slower it will go. So be aware of that <coughs> if you're in the back. Uh, okay, um, so I am going to show you a series of maps today, uh, and I'm going to talk about what I think they let us see. Uh, maps, I would suggest, are not typically uh, what comes to mind first when you're talking about studying the Holocaust and Nazism. Uh, <clears throat> maps don't necessarily allow us to see the personalities of Jews or Germans uh, and uh, typically the voices of Jews uh, through diaries or memoirs provide an evocative expression of the experience of the Holocaust. The words of the perpetrators might allow us a glimpse into the mindset of murderers and maps just don't necessarily do that. 
But I believe that maps can show us something else uh, really valuable about the nature of Nazism and the Holocaust. They give us a spatial sense of uh, events and processes and changes over time. Uh, <clears throat> They give us a spatial sense of demographics and population movements, for instance. Uh, we get a spatial sense of key Nazi ideologies and practices of, for instance, race and space. Uh, many Holocaust uh, uh, and Nazi scholars would suggest that race and space are at the heart of Nazism. And what I'm talking about there is uh, <clears throat> that Nazis imagine a Darwinian struggle of races for survival. Uh, and that survival demands perpetual struggle to become ever greater. It demands the destruction or subjugation of competitors for survival. And it demands space, greater space, for a greater nation in this process of struggle. And so those are <clears throat> uh, issues in Nazism and the Holocaust that I think we can see spatially through maps. So that's a bit of introduction to where I'm going with all of this. I'm going to uh, travel over quite a bit of time and quite a bit of uh, space in the world uh, over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Uh, <clears throat> this first picture that we've been seeing for a while now is an allegory of the partition of Poland uh, from the late 1700s. We'll return to this issue a number of times over the, the course of the talk, but I just want to really quickly say Poland is being divided up by uh, Russia, Austria, and Prussia, uh, and you know, our first map. And now we see if I can make this work. Aha, excellent. Um, this is a map of Jewish diaspora from 1100 to 1500. And what you see in this map is uh, areas in yellow are areas from which Jews were expelled uh, from areas of Europe over a long period of time. Uh, and uh, the, the classic one that I always remember is 1492. Uh, Jews were expelled from Spain. Uh, <clears throat> but in any case, a number of different regions decide that the Jews have to leave. And you can see arrows where Jews go from where they've been expelled. And one of the things that you see developing in this map is that a lot of these arrows of where Jews are going after being expelled is there. Eastern Europe, Poland. This is a map of uh, Jewish communities in the Pale of Settlement in 1897. The Pale of Settlement it actually also includes Congress Poland, but so it's an incorrect map slightly. But anyway, uh, the Pale of Settlement is a western portion of the Russian Empire. The Russians didn't really like Jews either, uh, and so they decided to designate the fringe area in the west as an area where Jews were allowed to live. Uh, so this is an area of a high concentration of Jewish population in Eastern Europe. Uh, and the Western Russian Empire. Uh, <clears throat> you can see these dots all indicate communities of Jews and the different colors and sizes of dots indicate different sized Jewish communities. The largest ones are the dots in red. Uh, and um, those communities include the cities of Lodz, Warsaw, Vilna, which at the time was part of Poland, uh, uh, but later on would become part of Lithuania. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Kishinev, which is at the time in Ukraine, but is now the capital of Moldova, and Odessa uh, on the Bla uh, Black Sea. This is a map that shows population density of Jews as a proportion of the population. So the darker the red, the more Jews are in this region. So 17 plus percent uh, is in these darkest regions. What we're looking at in this map is, again, Eastern Europe. This is the Pale Settlement and Congress Poland. Uh, and so Germany is here. <clears throat> Russia is there. This is where Jews are in highest numbers in Europe. And <clears throat> uh, spoiler alert, uh, this is where the Holocaust will happen.
This next map is a map of the number of Jews per country uh, in various European countries. Uh, and again, what you see is the highest concentration is Poland, three million Jews. Uh, Soviet Union, two and a half million Jews. <clears throat> Romania, almost a million Jews. Lithuania, one and a half million, uh, sorry, 155,000 Jews. Uh, and then as you move further west, the numbers decline. Germany is uh, half a million. <clears throat> and that's in 1933. By 1939, there are fewer than 250,000 Jews in Germany. Uh, so, again, this is the highest concentration of Jews in Europe, but there are Jews everywhere in Europe. Um, so, that's a little bit about the history of where Jews are in Europe, and I'm going to shift directions now. Uh, to talk about Germans. Where are Germans? And this is a map from around 1300. Uh, and this is, uh, these dots represent locations uh, where the Teutonic Knights are located. So the Teutonic Knights were formed during the, the Crusades in the Holy Land, and they got kicked out of the Holy Land by the Muslims, and they decided to further their uh, efforts to save the world for God and Christianity and themselves uh, somewhere else. And so <clears throat> this is Germany, and this is to the east of Germany. This is into the Baltic states. Germans have a long memory of having been present in the East. And that's, I think, one of the main points I want to make with this map. If you've ever seen the movie uh, Alexander Nevsky, and you should if you haven't, uh, Alexander Nevsky is a film made by the Russians in about 1940, and they know the Germans are coming. And they make a movie about the Teutonic Knights invading and being really cruel, burning babies and such. It's a brilliant film. You should see it. It's beautiful. But anyway, that's who we're talking about. This map is uh, titled Home Away from Home. <clears throat> this is a map that shows where ethnic Germans live uh, <clears throat> leading up to uh, the Second World War. So here is Germany, lots of Germans in Germany. But these yellow bits are communities of ethnic Germans across Eastern Europe. Over a long period of time, hundreds and hundreds of years, <clears throat> Germans emigrated from Germany to various parts of the world, very often as a community where they maintained their culture their language, their religion. Uh, and so you can see spread across Eastern Europe into the Baltics, <clears throat> Poland, and as far as the Volga River, large numbers of ethnic Germans have settled in the East. This is a, a very similar map, essentially. It says the same thing. But the reason that I want to show you this map, it's not as easy to see. Uh, but this is a map from 1932. Uh, and in 1932, Germans produced this map. They're very conscious of the existence of all of these Germans out here in the East. Uh, and they imagine uniting all of these Germans under the German state as a German nation should be united. Uh, so this is uh, what we're doing here. Uh, <clears throat> Germans emigrated to more than just Eastern Europe. Here's a map of the world. This is from 1930. Again, Germans are aware in 1930, before the Nazis come to power, of the fact that the Germans are all over the place. Uh, there are 9 million ethnic Germans in the United States in about 1930, according to this map. Uh, there are <clears throat> almost uh, 620,000 Germans in Brazil. Th there are Germans everywhere. So <clears throat> one question that Germans might have asked is, where is Germany? Germany is where Germans are. Where are Germans? Germans are everywhere. I want to shift directions now again. Uh, and what I want to look at is Germany in the 19th century. 19th century Germany is really important context for where <clears throat> we're going to go in the 20th century. Uh, this map is of Germany, Prussia, and Austria. Germany is bounded by the red line. Prussia is in blue. Austria is in yellow. And a few things that you should see in this map. <clears throat> 
the map, again, the yellow line is Germany. And Austria and Prussia both have territory in their state that is not German. Who lives here? Poles. Who lives here? Not Germans. A range of other ethnicities. So already in the 19th century, there are a large number of ethnic minorities under the authority of Germans in Europe. This is another map of Germany in around 19, 1866, sorry, <clears throat> 1866. Prussia is in blue, Austria is in this sort of yellowish, orangish color. Germany is a bunch of different states and it's not formed into one country until 1871. But <clears throat> one of the things that you see again in this map, <clears throat> this is Germany. Uh, Austria is Germany in the 19th century. Uh, also, uh, this is today Czechoslovakia, um, <clears throat> and so Czechoslovakia in the 19th century is Germany. A uh, large number of non-ethnic Germans here we're talking. Uh, this is owned by Prussia, but it is not part of Germany. It is Polish Prussia, and therefore, again, an ethnic minority that is ruled by Germans. Now, in 1866, there's a war. Prussia and Austria both wanted to be the top dog in Germany. And so in 1866, it came to blows. Prussia won. And in 1866, Austria is expelled from Germany. And we changed this red line to here. So it is only in 1866 that Austria is not German anymore. This has an impact later on. For instance, when Germany annexes Austria in 1938, it comes from somewhere. This is another map of Germany in the 19th century. This is the Empire of Austria. We've got Germany here. We were just seeing a map that was that, and now we're just down here in Austria. And the colors indicate ethnic minorities, or ethnic uh, groups that are the majority in the region of that color. This sort of, again, ugly orange is German ethnic uh, majority. And so this is present day Austria. Uh, and then there's bits and pieces of uh, splotched German ethnic majority elsewhere. But otherwise, you've got <coughs> Italians, Magyars, Romanians, Croats and Serbs, Czechs and Moravians, Poles, Slovaks, Slovenes and Ruthenians as ethnic peoples in this empire of Austria. What I really want to really make clear out of this series of maps uh, at this point is that Germans are very used to ruling over non-Germans, particularly Eastern Europeans, particularly Slavs. Uh, next, I'm going to shift again, again directions and look at world developments that serve as models for Germans and Nazis. Uh, so we move on to the world. This is a map of the world on the eve of the First World War, 1914. And what you see in this map, the colors represent the colonial possessions of various Western powers. So the colors that are in red are possessions of Britain. Blue, possessions of France. And you see England has significant portions of Africa, India, Australia, and beyond, Canada. Uh, France has large portions of Africa, Indochina, various other places. Any European country that wants to be a self-respecting European country has a global empire. That means Belgium owns the Congo. Uh, the Netherlands, tiny little Netherlands, owns Indonesia. Uh, it's the fifth largest country in the world and it's owned by the Netherlands. <clears throat> Spain owns parts of Africa. Uh, Portugal owns what is today Mo Angola and Mozambique. Everybody who's respectable in Europe has a racist colonial empire. This is something that the Germans come late to because they're only formed as a country in 1871, so they need to catch up. And so they get kind of what's left over. But they get it, damn it. So they have Togo, Cameroon, German Southwest Africa, and Tanzania as colonies to be like other great powers. 
I would point out that the United States also has uh, the Philippines as its colonial possession in the world that I will mention. Um, the next map that I want to look at uh, demonstrates the significance of North America and the concept of manifest destiny for the imagination of German Empire. So uh, I'm going to show a map of North America. It's a series of maps of North America. And what these maps show is the gradual progression of uh, white settler ownership of land and the expropriation of land from Native Americans uh, from 1784 to <coughs> uh, 1872 or something like that. Anyway, so gradually, Manifest Destiny suggests that naturally Americans must move west uh, to capture the savage wilderness for civilization and to make America greater and greater and greater. Uh, and the Germans are aware of this. They see this. They actually send people to North America to learn how it's done. Uh, this is an important idea because the Germans' imagination of their manifest destiny is the savage wilderness to the east. Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia. The last map in this series I want to talk about is <clears throat> we come back to the first slide for the, the day, the partition of Poland. This is a map of the partition of Poland at the end of the 18th century, 1700s. Uh, <clears throat> and what you see here is Germany, particularly Prussia, Austria, and Russia deciding in the late 18th century that Poland is too weak and therefore too ripe to be gobbled up. And they divide up Poland m amongst themselves. Prussia takes this, Austria takes this, Russia takes this, so that Poland does not exist anymore. Uh, so there is a history in Europe of Poland being taken over by more powerful states to the east and the west. I would like to remind you uh, briefly of the demographics of Jews that I talked about before. Where do Jews live? They live here in large numbers. So this is a moment that matters for future history. I'm going to turn next to the First World War. This is a map of uh, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. In 1917, uh, the Soviets, the Bolsheviks, had their revolution. And the Bolsheviks overturned the Tsarist Empire. <clears throat> and the Bolsheviks had promised to the Russian people, as their campaign slogan, uh, bread, peace, and land. Okay. One of the really important promises they made was peace. We will end the war. And so as soon as the Bolsheviks took power, they said, we need to end the war now.